I'd like to welcome each of you tonight. <coughs> Christmas Eve worship. We've got volume, have we? I thought we'd. Just give me a minute here. I want to see what's making that boom, boom, boom. We don't need any drummer boys here in my pocket. You think that's what it is, Lanny? It is. Okay. Something's not good. I don't like that. <coughs> Forgive me. We'll just use this mic, okay? I want to welcome each of you to our Christmas Eve worship tonight and especially to worship in general. Tonight's a special night, but worship is a part of every day and especially every Sunday. And I was thinking about worship in particular tonight as we were getting ready, and what an incredible difference that's made in my life over the years. And so if, if any of you don't have a regular church home that you attend, I want to encourage you to really search for a place where you can belong to a spiritual family and be a part of that worshiping community. We are so glad for each of you that are here with us tonight. Some of our family members have returned from uh, where they've been scattered over the years, especially our children and grandchildren that have grown up in this church. We welcome you home and are so glad to have you back with us tonight. We are going to have the privilege tonight of lighting the Christ candle in our Advent wreath. And uh, we've got uh, the Lively family who are going to do that for us. So if they want to come forward, uh, we'll do that right now. <clears throat> In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, or a husband's will, but born of God. Tonight we light the Christ candle. We light this candle as a symbol of our faith in you. We light this candle in the knowledge that without you there is no faith. You are our faith. Lord, we have waited so long, and still we wait. But on this day, on this night, we shout into the darkness and declare the victory of your light. For you have come, and by coming, you have made us into something more than simply a people waiting in darkness. You have given us your life. O holy child of Bethlehem, descend on us, we pray. Cast out our sin and enter in. Be born in us today. We hear the Christmas angels, the great glad tidings tell. O oh, come to us, abide with us, our Lord Emmanuel. Thank you, Barrett. Thank you, Bailey. Thank you, Isaac. We're going to sing our Advent song.
If you would join me in our prayer in unison as we pray together, you can follow along in your bulletin or up on the screens. Lord Jesus, on this Christmas Eve, we pause to prepare our hearts for another joyful celebration, your birth and coming to earth to become our Savior and our Lord. Please clear our minds so we can focus on you and the joy you bring to us through your gift of salvation. May the same thrill and anticipation that filled Mary, the chosen mother of Jesus, inspire us tonight and draw us closer to you. May our spirits cry out, Alleluia, with the host of angels who first delivered the good news of great joy to humble, awestruck shepherds that night so long ago, the news that would forever change the world. Help us receive and celebrate the blessings of your incarnation. You are Emmanuel, Prince of Peace and Savior of the world. We welcome you once more and thank you for redeeming us of our sins. Amen. And if you would join me in our call to worship tonight. Beloved Heavenly Father, you opened up the heavens and sent your Son down to earth in human form. He was, and He forever is, Emmanuel, God with us and for us. You sent Gabriel to speak to Mary and to Joseph, announcing that she would conceive a miracle child, the Son of God, and that Joseph would take Mary as his wife and raise the Son of God as his very own. Joseph obeyed you, and they named the baby Jesus, for he would save his people. Emmanuel, God with us and for us. This Jesus is the Christ. He was born in a stable and laid in a manger. His life was spirit-filled and blameless. He healed the sick, fed the hungry, and opened his arms to sinners. He is the Lamb of God who died for the sins of the world. <laughs> Emmanuel, God with us and for us. This Jesus lives, heals, and intercedes for his people. He is exalted to the right hand of Father God, and together they sent us the Holy Spirit, who remains with us and who lives in us. Blessed be the Holy Spirit, and blessed be Emmanuel, God with us and for us. Tonight, we celebrate and give thanks for Christ's birth, his life, his death, and his resurrection, and we anticipate his promised return. May your presence fill us, your power perfect us, and your spirit empower us. We want our lives to reflect your wonderful life, light, and love. Be born in us, Emmanuel. Amen. If our children would come forward tonight, we'll have a children's moment together. But he is... Welcome, welcome, welcome. We are so glad to see each of you with us. This is a special night. Growing up, this was one of my favorite nights of the year. We had been looking forward to, to Christmas. The tree was up, the lights were up, the presents were wrapped. Some of them were under the tree. Most of them were hidden because if mom and dad put the presents out, we couldn't but help get a hold of them and shake them and try to take a peek to see what the gifts were. So sometimes mom and dad would have to hide the presents till we all went to bed. And then they'd bring them all out. And boy, early morning, Christmas morning, we were up and we were there to have a look and see what Santa had brought us. Well, tonight I want to talk a little bit about joy. 
And the joy we're going to talk about is the joy of being saved, God's salvation. But before we talk about salvation, I want to ask you, what have you done or what gift have you received in the past that really made you happy? What has made you really happy as you think back, made you smile or laugh or even shout out, Woohoo! I got what I wanted. Anybody, something special that has happened that has made you really happy. I mean, over the moon happy. Your ear pods. Yes, the wireless kind. Oh, yeah, those are really nice. A lovely gift. Anybody else, when you can look back and say, boy, that was something special. Wow. <laughs> well, I can remember wanting pistols, two cowboy pistols with the holsters, the belt, and of course, little sheriff's badge, some of the the caps that went with that. Ooh. And when my mom and dad bought me that set of pistols with the holsters and the sheriff's badge, I was over the moon. And I want you to know I shot every bad guy that was anywhere near. I had the biggest time all Christmas day long and many days after that. And I remember when I wanted a surfboard so bad and my mom finally said, okay, I'll buy you one and a wetsuit and a leash for my uh, ankle that could hold the board from washing away and getting wax on it and all of those things. And I was so excited and boy, I took that surfboard down to the beach every day and learned how to surf and enjoyed it. And then maybe the best memory of all was when uh, I got on my knee and I asked Cindy if she'd marry me and she said yes. You know, we never know what the answer is gonna be. We hope it's gonna be yes. If it's, let me think about it. Or worse yet, no. You talk about crushed. But when you pop the question, boys, one day, and you get a yes, man, I was over the moon. I was flying high. And that was over 36 years ago, and still my heart is full of love and joy because of what God has done in our lives. So, special moments. We're going to talk about joy. And to get us started, I made a few little cards here. You know how to spell joy, right? The first letter is? J. J okay. And the next letter is? L. O. And then? Y. y. So somebody has said if you take that word and you break it down, the J is for? Jesus. Jesus. The O is for? For others, and the why is for? Yeah. For you. Now, here's a sadness. Although that's a good idea, most of us don't live like that. The why, the you, is normally first. We want to be first. I want the big piece of cake. I want to be first in line. I want the special present. I want to be the best the king of the castle. And all of us have that inbuilt desire to be number one. So rather than being last, we want to be first. And then, if we are good and kind, we might care for others, especially a brother, a sister, a friend, mom or dad. And then, last of all, comes, comes Jesus. Even though we know Jesus is wonderful and he, he's done amazing things for us and he, he loves us, most people just leave him right till last. And that will never change unless God does something wonderful inside of us. If he comes into our lives and he forgives us our sins and he gives us a new heart and then that backward way of living can change and all of a sudden we can put Jesus first and then we can put others next and, and then take care of ourselves as well so this is how jesus put it you must love god with all your heart soul mind and strength and you must love your neighbor as yourself 
with your heart. So there's three groups there, God, neighbors, and you. And God wants all of us to be loved. God wants all of us to be cared for. But if we're going to get it right, who comes first? Jesus. And who comes next? Others. Others, Other people. And last of all comes us. So if we can find that with God's help, we're going to find joy. Real joy, the kind of joy God wanted us to have. And that's what salvation is. That's what being saved is. Allowing God to come into our lives and giving us a new heart that puts him first, that puts others next, and that allows us to come up third or last. But all the while, everybody's getting as much love as they need. When you come third or I come third, we're in our right place. God takes good care of us. Remember, he loved us so much that he gave us Jesus to die in our place so that our sins could be forgiven, so that we could be a part of his family. Let's pray together. Lord, we want joy, but most times we go backwards. We start with the the why, the you, the me. We want to be first. Please change that. We want Jesus to be first, and then we want to love and care for others, and then we are willing to come last, least. Please, God, fill us with your spirit. May the joy of Christmas, the joy of your love, fill each of our hearts. We pray it in Jesus' name. And all the children said aloud, Amen. Amen. There will be candy for you at the close of the service. We are so glad you are with us tonight. I have great joy tonight as I brag a little on God and what God has done in the lives of this spiritual family. I think we can all say this has been an unusual year. And at best, it's been challenging. At worst, it's been terrifying. As people we know have got ill, as we ourselves have got ill, as some have died and some are dying right now. It's been a frightening year. It's been a year where we've had to cancel worship services and do them online. It's been a year where we've had to do social distancing to try and keep everybody safe. It's a year where businesses have really struggled. It's been kind of an upside down kind of a year. But I want to brag a little on the faithfulness of God in the midst of all of this. You know, somebody has said when it's really dark outside, That's when the light shines the brightest. Man, you can see a light, even a little candlelight, when it's real dark. And I want you to know that the light of Christ has shone brightly in Gaiman and at Victory Memorial during 2020. Those of you that have grown up here, you know that this family has a big heart, a heart for God and a heart for people. We have joy. We put Jesus first and others next, and we come up behind them. And we're glad for that position, glad just to be included, glad to be along for the ride. So I want to celebrate every prayer that has been offered, every neighbor that has come here and has received a welcome, has received counsel, has received comfort. Each person that has left here with a bus ticket or money for prescriptions or help toward a bill a utility bill that they couldn't pay. Each person that's visited the clothing closet and been able to get clothes there at a very affordable price, a dollar an item. And many of those items are beautiful, quality clothing that has been donated and made available to our neighbors. All the meals that have been served, especially to families that have been grieving because they've lost loved ones. We have a group of women in this church that go out of their way to love and serve and bless. All the groceries that have been collected. I was never prouder than to see the community gather and do the Christmas boxes again this year. They've been doing it for almost 20 years. And a lot of hungry family members are given not only a good Christmas, but for many of them a good week or two worth of groceries. Not because we have to, but because we want to. 
I've discovered that people get excited about making a difference in the lives of others. And I want to say that Christ and his family here at Victory Memorial are making a difference in the lives of others. Some of the finest people I've ever met live right here in Guymon. People I am privileged to count among my friends and family. What a joy it has been. Three years, and it has passed so quickly. It was three years ago I came, and uh, now I feel like I'm a part of the panhandle community. So I just want to celebrate God's goodness in the midst of the pandemic, in the midst of the struggles, in the midst of death and sickness. God has been so good to us, and we have followed the very best we can. I want to celebrate that. The offering tonight will be placed in a chest there uh, at the entrance that you came in. Most of you, uh, on those double doors, there's a wooden chest. We just do that to minimize uh, touching so that there's not uh, a whole lot of possibility to pass on um, a flu or a COVID virus. Or there's uh, online giving or, of course, the regular snail mail or a, a stop at the church office. I want to brag again, we've had so many of our members who've come uh, faithfully each week and said, he has my tithe, he has a financial gift, God has blessed me, I want to share it with some, someone else in need. Uh, just a wonderful uh, a community that loves and serves, and what a privilege it is to be a part of it. Luke chapter 6 verse 38 says, Give and it will be given to you a good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. If you would stand with me tonight, we will sing our doxology together. You may be seated. We are blessed tonight to have Sandy and Matthew with us. Matthew's going to be sharing special music. And after the, the meditation, Sandy will be sharing with us. Thank you, Matthew.
Thank you, Matthew. <clears throat> Our scripture tonight comes out of Luke chapter 2, reading from verse 1 to verse 20. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria. And everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and the line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. And she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth, peace to those on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and had gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. This is the word of the Lord. Let us have a prayer together. Lord, as this scripture has been read once more, many of us have heard it again and again. I pray that the wonder of what's happening would fill each one of us. That this incredible news, this life-changing news, would fill us with, with an expectation and a joy. A joy that would really change our lives tonight and in the days ahead. O come, O come, Emmanuel is our prayer. Amen. For many years, Christmas had lost its real meaning in my life and in the life of most of my siblings. It was a fun time. We certainly had good meals and we had presents, and we sang songs, but the significance of Christmas was somehow lost to me and my family. Uh, none of us were really God-fearing or Christ-following. I had a sister, an older sister, who attended church some and occasionally taught Sunday school some. She was about as uh, righteous and as godly a person as we had in our family and she was the one who my dad would say you keep an eye on the boys especially and if they do anything that they're not supposed to you tell me and when I come home I'll take care of business and he did and there was normally a lot to report of course we broke the rules quite often and so Christmas was a fun time it was special but the significance of the incarnation of what God had done and was doing was for the most part 
lost on us. Even though we grew up in a Christian nation where there was lots of opportunity to go to church, even though there was Bible instruction in school and plenty of Bibles around, there wasn't a whole lot of interest. There wasn't a true connection with God and an appreciation for what that all meant. I'm pleased to say tonight that that all changed significantly when Christ became real to me at 17. When I opened my heart to Him and received Him as Savior in my life, all of a sudden the significance of Christmas took on a whole new meaning, uh, far beyond decorating and gift giving and singing some songs. All of a sudden the wonder of God stepping into our lives and changing our lives and saving us became the very heart of Christmas. And of course, for many years, I was just uh, following Christ like any normal uh, Christian would, a part of the youth group, a part of worship services, helping out where I could. But the wonder of Christmas was now real and stirring within me. And as I started singing those Christmas carols, the words took on new meaning. I'd memorize some of those words, but they didn't do anything to me. But once my heart was filled with Christ, then all of a sudden, singing Hark the Herald Angels Sing, or singing Joy to the World, or Little Town of Bethlehem, all of a sudden, the wonder of the gospel, the wonder of who Christ was, now had full effect in my life. I was reminded of Martin Luther, the great reformer. Martin Luther grew up in a Christian nation, Germany, and uh, was a good student. His daddy wanted him to be a lawyer. He was a good student, did his college work, got his undergrad, got his master's, actually started practicing as a lawyer, and then found himself in a terrible thunderstorm. It was so bad, it scared the <laughs> spit out of him, literally. He fell down and he said, God, if you'll save me, I'll I'll become a monk. And he did, there was a lightning strike with just feet away from where he was, and he was saved. And so he went home and he told his dad, I'm going to become a monk. And his dad was not pleased at all. His dad had groomed him for, for law school and becoming a lawyer. But sure to his promise, he went and became a monk within about a week after that experience. And for about 12 agonizing years, Martin Luther tried to be good enough to merit salvation, to get to know God. He would do penance. He would sometimes deny himself or beat himself. He would do all kinds of things. There were all kinds of practices back then that were required of you if you were going to please God and get close to God. And the further he went, the more depressed he became because he realized he wasn't good enough and he couldn't be good enough. And he, he almost felt that God was unfair, that God set a standard so high that it was impossible to reach the standard. He was desperate. He studied the scriptures. He prayed. He did all the things that the church required of him. He went to confession. In fact, he confessed so many sins that they finally would say, Martin, go out there and commit some sins, some real sins, and then come back. I mean... He would think of everything. He was desperate. And one day, he was reading the scriptures out of Galatians. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. This is what it says. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life that I now live, I live by faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. All of a sudden, the truth of that text dawned on Martin Luther, and he started weeping. All of a sudden, he realized that he could never be good enough, and that's why Jesus came. And all those things he was trying to do to please God were not capable of saving him. Only faith in Christ could save and the part that really struck him like a two by four was the way that scripture ends. Who loved me and gave himself 
for me. And he started weeping and he started saying, for me, for me. This is what Christmas is all about. An encounter with Christ that helps you realize and helps me realize that it's for me, that he died for me, that he loves me, that he wants to save me, that he came to this earth and lived our life and died on that cross to pay for your sin and mine. And as we acknowledge him and receive him, truly receive him, where we can say, I am crucified with Christ. It's no longer I that live, but it's Christ who now lives in me. I must pause there. No matter if you've grown up in a Christian nation, no matter if you've been in many worship services, no matter if you believe things about God, it's not the same as what Martin Luther was experiencing. Oh my God, it's for me. It's real. You love me. You want to change me. You want to help me. Yeah, I'm a monk and I'm desperate. I've tried everything and nothing's working. I'm not good enough. That is true for every one of us. There's not one of us sitting here that's good enough, that can do enough, that can earn that relationship. Jesus came to give us that relationship, to welcome us into God's family. Jesus came to provide that new life that we can, each one of us, claim and then confess to others, it's no longer I that live, but it's Christ who lives in me. And this life that I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I thought about Mary and what a surprise it must have been for her to hear news that she was going to be pregnant even before she was married. And not just pregnant, but carry God's child. I guess on one level, that's every young woman's dream to have a child and to be honored to have God's child, well, hard to wrap your mind around that. But we are told that she received that news and said, okay, and went along with it. And I can only imagine the emotions, the dreams that she must have had as she was going along in that pregnancy all the way to its end. I was thinking today when I was outside, what was that last day like for Mary in Bethlehem? you know, really big, ready to burst. You know, the last week or so of the pregnancy is very uncomfortable. Mary's just right at that stage, and yeah, they're in a strange place and a makeshift accommodation. And I'm sure little Joseph is sweating bullets. What are we going to do? How are we going to get this? You know, if you study history, pregnancies were very dangerous. Many mothers lost their lives in pregnancy. Many babies were still born or soon after would die after the, after the birthing. I was just thinking about the joy and the wonder and the excitement and the terror that must have filled that little teenage heart. Doing it the first time. Mothers tell me the first time round's really tough. Yeah, she's just young and in a strange place and Joseph is going to help her. Maybe there were some others we don't know. But there they receive the child this promise of joy Mary had been promised that this child would bring joy but also great pain great conflict a piercing of her heart those shepherds in the field just minding their own business and the angels show up and say listen we've got good news for you joy a savior has been born a messiah the Lord they're so excited that they leave and rush off to Bethlehem to see it, and they come back ecstatic. The joy of hearing what God was doing. Now, I'm not sure they knew what that meant. How was this little baby going to save them? How was he going to be the Lord? What did the Lord mean? Did it mean a new king? Did it mean a military conquest? I'm not sure what was in their minds. But they were excited that they had heard news from God himself, and that something exciting was going to happen. And I want to challenge you tonight. What does that mean to you? And what does it mean to me? That God has shown up on our planet. 
that God has come to save us, that He is the Lord. In the life of Martin Luther, it meant a deep personal encounter with God that changed him forever. Martin Luther became the reformer that changed many of the abuses of the church at that stage, that took us back to the Word of God and the importance of the Word of God, that took us back to real living faith in Christ, born again, following Him, serving Him, trusting Him. He had quite a journey. If you'll study his life, his very life was threatened. They had to put him in hiding. God used him mightily to change the face of Germany and many of those European nations and ultimately our whole understanding of Christianity. A whole wave of reform took place out of this individual's life who encountered God in a deeply personal and life-changing way. And it is my prayer tonight that that will happen in you and me. That as we sing the carols, as we think about the coming of Christ, that the joy of this whole experience would burst forth in our lives. That we will realize that Christmas is about being saved. God intervening. God stepping in and looking for a way to change your life and mine if we will allow Him the opportunity to do it. It's not enough to be raised in a Christian nation. It's not enough to be a member of a Christian family or to be a part of worship. It's got to become very real and personal, just like it did in Martin Luther's life as he started weeping and saying, for me, for me. The joy of salvation is for you and for me so that we will know the joy of sins forgiven we will know the joy of having God's Spirit fill us. We will know that our names are written in the Lamb's book of life. We will know that our eternity is secure in God's keeping. You know why? Because Jesus has promised personally to prepare a place for us as we encounter Him and live in relationship with Him. So here's my challenge. May this Christmas be the most joyful of all. May the joy of those shepherds be our joy. May the joy of Mary be our joy. May the joy of Joseph as he sees that baby born and then raises that baby to become the man that would later be the Jesus who healed the sick and fed the hungry and, and finally hung on that cross and paid for our sins. Imagine how sad and proud Joseph must have been to say, I was an integral part of his life. God entrusted him into my care to raise him and help him be the man that God wanted him to be. I pray that each of us will give God full access to our lives where we will say with confidence, I am crucified with Christ. Yet I live not I, but Christ now lives in me. And this life that I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Let us pray. Lord, how very glad we are to be here tonight to celebrate your birthday, to think deeply about what it means for you to become a man, God becoming a man, the God-man, who would teach, who would feed, who would heal, who would confront evil, who would stand up for the oppressed, and who would finally die a sinner's death so that he could save each one of us from our sins. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that you were willing to be crucified for us and that you rose again on that third day so that each of us could know the joy of salvation, so that each of us could join you in that crucifixion, so that each of us could rise to newness of life with you in your resurrection. May the joy of your salvation have full effect in our lives. We pray it tonight in your precious name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Sandy's going to share with us a holy night, and I guess uh, Matthew's going to accompany her.
Thank you, Matthew. One of my all-time favorite Christmas carols, Oh Holy Night, what a beautiful hymn that is. We're going to celebrate Holy Communion together. All are welcome to be a part. It is our persuasion that all are invited to Christ's table as we repent of our sin and seek to live in close relationship with Christ and each other. So join me in our liturgy. It'll be up on the screen. Christ our Lord invites to His table all who love Him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and before one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and a joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and we join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus the Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, his death, and his resurrection, you gave birth to your church. You delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and you made with us a new covenant by water and by the Spirit. On that night that Jesus gave himself up for us, he took bread, and after he had given thanks to you, he broke the bread, and he gave it to his disciples, and he said, take and eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, and he gave thanks to you, and he gave it to his disciples, and he said, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we now offer ourselves in praise and in thanksgiving as a holy and a living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as together we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. And now we pray, O God, pour out your Holy Spirit on each one of us gathered here on these gifts of bread and juice. Make them be for us the body and the blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, those who are redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now with confidence of children of God, let us pray that prayer Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I hear those amens. 
<laughs> Don't you worry. It's good to see you in worship and good to hear those cries. We are going to partake with individual elements tonight. There's a very thin cellophane wrapping on the top, clear plastic, that you've got to peel back. And the little wafer is then on the top of this aluminum cover. And then you get to take the bread, and then you've got to peel back the aluminum cover off the little vessel, and then you get to drew the juice. Now, the trick is, you mustn't pull the aluminum off first, because then it gets really hard to get that little piece of bread out there. So if you'll just feel on the side, yeah, the little plastic will come right up, and you'll be able to peel it. If you need help, just raise your hand, and I'll be glad to help you. So we're going to ask you just to come up in pews, so that we don't all crowd. We'll just come up uh, in a pew at a time and uh, fill up from both sides. And then uh, I'll dismiss the group that's up here. And then the next group will come. It'll take us a little while. We've got some Christmas carols we'll sing while everybody's celebrating communion. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Come and celebrate God's goodness.
We're going to pray our prayer after the communion service, and after that, we will enter into the reflection time with the lights dimmed and uh, a special opportunity for candlelight and a beautiful song and reflection to go with that. Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us. Grant that we may go into the world in the strength of your Spirit to give ourselves for others. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. As we prepare for our candlelight, I want you to imagine this evening what it must have been like for Mary and also for Joseph and for the world that they lived in on that very first Christmas Eve. There were no doctors available, no birthing rooms, no emergency medical equipment available if there were complications, no sterile environment. Their surroundings were awfully humble. There was no heating or cooling available, no pain relief, no antibiotics, no doctors that they could call if things went wrong. The lighting in that area must have been minimal. The shadows in the room were dark and imposing. And yet, God chose to send His most precious gift to us in that world at that time, in that very place. God took a great risk because of his love for you and his love for me, his love for every person that has ever lived or ever will live. Jesus, the light of the world, came to shine in the darkness of our lives. Those who follow him are no longer in darkness, but now have the light of life. When our lives are darkened by confusion, darkened by doubt, Jesus is still there. When our hearts are darkened by sorrow or by tragedy, Jesus is still there. When the evil of our world seems to overwhelm us with the darkness, Jesus is still there. When the darkness of broken homes, broken relationships, and broken promises break our lives and break our lives and our hearts, Jesus is still there. When it seems our lives and our world are full of darkness, Jesus is still there. When all the difficult challenges of life threaten to overcome us, Jesus is still there. Hear what the Scriptures have to say. The people who sat in darkness have seen a great light, and upon those who sat in the region and shadow of death, light has dawned. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness could not put it out. The true light which enlightens everyone was coming into the world. On that first Christmas, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. May the light of Christ shine in us and through us.
We will now light our candles. Just one little flame in the darkness <clears throat> Just one little flicker of light Excuse me. Just one small glimmer of brightness Dispelling the darkness of night But oh, what God did to the darkness with one little flicker of light oh what god did with its brightness when it touched just one other life then two lights reached out with new brightness and soon there were four and then more so quickly his light conquered darkness as new lights flared up by the score no longer just one light in the darkness no longer just one tiny flame now the world's aglow with his brightness since the Jesus came. Jesus, 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 the light of the world. Jesus, Jesus. Jesus, the light of the world, worship him, worship him, Jesus, the light of the world, worship him, worship him, Jesus, the light of the world. Just one little flame, one flicker of light. Just one little flame, now the world's a glow. Jesus, the God did to the darkness.
receive God's blessing as we end worship and enter into the mission field that God has placed us within. There was no easy way for God to save us. It required the death of his only son as an atoning sacrifice. May the love that brought him down to earth to save you and me, the love that allowed him to heal the sick, feed the hungry, and to forgive sinners, May the gift of that love keep us close to him and to one another. Amen. When you blow your candle out, if you would just put your hand behind the flame and then you won't have wax going. Keep your candle upright if you would. And there will be boxes at the back of the, of the church where you can drop off your candle. And if we could just start filing out from the back row uh, and just let's take a little time so that we're not all clumped together and uh, that way we can get uh, as little contact if you will as as we possibly can a merry christmas to each one of you